All right, welcome back to the Real Teacher Talk podcast with Mr. Nunez, a podcast about uh, education for teachers, students, and for our community here at Mesa's. And I have a very special guest today, my man, Dr. Teddy McMillan. Welcome, doctor. Well, thanks a lot. Definitely happy to be here. Um, you know, I got a warm welcome from your staff, um, your students. You got a fabulous team here. Um, so happy to be here on your campus. You talked to me a lot about it. So again, I'm just happy to be here to have a conversation with you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, obviously, you had a great experience um, as far as your education went. So, tell me, reading was a big part of your life. I know it was in high school. I mean, we had the same English teacher, right? And get, shared those novels with us. Mr. And G. Mr. G. That's Mr. Right, hey, that's shout right. out to Mr. Goodikins. We're going to share this with Absolutely. Mr. Goodikins, Absolutely. right? And um, was really big on uh, writing and, and being articulate, right? Yes. And I have to ask, what was your experience like as uh, maybe elementary, middle school, high school, where, where it all began for you? Yeah. You know, I went to a small school in, in Compton, California. Um, back in, the, if I say the, 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 the decades, I think everybody's going to know my age, but I guess I'm, I'm not afraid to tell that. I'm a little bit over 50, not too far away from 55. Sorry, man, I'm in the same club, man. <laughs> so I guess I told our age because we went to high school together. Um, but very early, I just, I just love stories. My mom was a great storyteller. But in elementary school, I had some really great teachers who really, like, immersed us in, in African-American history. Uh, particularly looking at literature. We learned the Black National Anthem in the in the fourth grade. Okay. You know, um, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven rings, ring with the harmonies of liberty. You know, those are things we had to actually stand up in the classroom and learn about. Uh, I learned about people like James Weldon Johnson, who was one of the authors of um, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is the Black National Anthem. Learned about Langston Hughes. Um, was really, you know, um, gravitated towards his his writing. Uh, one in particular was Mother of the Son, the poem that he wrote, which reminded me of my relationship with me and my mom. Well, son, I tell you, life of me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up in places with no carpet on the floor bare. Oh. But all the times I've been reaching on and turning corners and sometimes going to the dark where there ain't been no light. So, boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on those steps because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall down for I'm still climbing, honey. I'm still going because life of me ain't been no crystal stair. I learned that in the fourth grade. So I was already like really excited about books and writing. I love the smell of books. Mm -hmm. I love the smell of walking into a library. It's, it's, it's like the, a scent that really excites me. And I get really like interested in reading about new stories and new people, new experiences. So I kind of took that with me to middle school and also to high school. And then I had some really great um, teachers to help me kind of like get even more excited about writings that I probably you know, didn't know much about um, people like Nathaniel Hawthorne, who says um, um, words as, as powerless and meaningless as they are standing in the dictionary, mm -hmm. but how potent for good and evil they become when in the hands of those who know how to combine them. So I remember reading about Nathaniel Hawthorne at Verm Day High School, which really opened my eyes to like uh, even, even uh, more um, works that I, I got really excited about. We read Of Mice and Men, we read, of course, um, to Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. Those are some really exciting books I read as a kid. Also reading about um, people like Richard Wright. Learned about him really early. So I was really um, excited about picking up a book and reading a story and allowing my mind to kind of go into that adventure from a, uh, another person's perspective. Right. So yeah, I was- So it was only yeah. a natural progression that Absolutely. you went from reading to becoming a writer. Yes, yes. And now using that, uh, that skill, right, to go ahead and make change happen. Okay, right. and I think one of the reasons why I think you were so prolific at it um, is that you read probably uh, for pleasure. You had your own set of books that you were reading. A lot of times our kids, and I know as an English teacher, when I was an English teacher, I would assign books. But I think the key to becoming a better writer or just uh, learning as much as possible about the world is picking up that book yourself. Yeah, picking absolutely. up a book that you like to read. Absolutely. Right? And I know it's, and we talked about this, finding books that kids can connect to, right? So as, t so as, a, as a reader, as a writer, what kind of advice can you offer a teacher who's an English teacher to connect, to have their students connect in the classroom? 
That's a that's a really great question, and I think it's one of my motivations for even writing. And I'm gonna go back to one of my early teaching days back in the late 1990s. I know I'm aging us again. But, there you go. But it's all right. We I look good. We, we look good. though. we, we, we look we good. <laughs> go ahead. Um, late 1990s. I'm sitting in the classroom. I taught at a alternative school through LA County. It was called um, Tri Community. And I'm working with 25 different students. So I get them excited about the same books that I read as a high school student and a middle school student. Um, these are the same books I just mentioned, some of the classics. I think it was A Mice and Men and To Kill a Mockingbird. Those are two of my favorite. Uh, my favorite all of time is Where the Red Fern Grows. But anyway, I'm passing the books out and I, you know, trying to get kids excited about it. And I, I drop one of the books on one of the kids' desk in the back of the classroom, and he pushed the book back away from him. And I felt a little disrespected in that, but we had a really great relationship in the classroom. I said, hey, man, what's, what's going on? You pushed the book away. He said, I don't want to read this. I said, why not? So we stepped outside. We had a little conversation. He said, that book has nothing to do with me. And I had to, I had to agree with him. So one of the things I did as a result of that was I asked him, I said, listen, if you stay engaged, I'll, I'll, I'll promise you I'll bring in other books that, that you might enjoy. So after that, I started bringing in more material, and he really uh, began to get more excited about, about reading in the classroom. He was reading, um, taking the initiative to read in the classroom, involved in conversation. I can see that his, his kind of his analysis of the text grew, mm -hmm. um, and I think it really helped his analytical skills because he was involved in conversation. Um, but those are some of the things I think back on is really my motivation for wanting to write books that reflect students in the classroom. So I my advice to teachers is, you know, to be culturally responsive in the classroom is really thinking about how you can instruct to engage learners that are come from various backgrounds and various types of learners. And I think we have to recognize kind of the cultural and the lived experience of students in the classroom so that they can connect and see themselves reflected in the books that we read. So I would encourage them to uh, not, you know, just look at the traditional curriculum that's been handed to us and think that is, that is the end of, of, you know, discussion as far as providing relevant content. It's really about exploring ways to engage students. And I think one of the ways is to, to get materials that reflect who they are. Right. So a little homework on our part as teachers. Yes. Get I'll out believe. there and look for content that's written uh, for us, by us. Absolutely. Hey. Absolutely. So with that, this month being African American History Month, um, you know, we usually, you know, pull out... Uh, you know, we dig into the history books and we start looking for heroes, African-American heroes. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see, I know there's some probably heroes that we all know and understand, yeah. but are there any specific heroes that stand wow. out for you? There's so many of them. I know, you I know, know but I mean, there's... Yeah, so, um, first I have to say, you know, my parents. My, yeah, my mom see, and I dad knew you were, were, were really like instrumental, like really understanding their, their struggle and, and kind of like the sacrifices they had to make to provide for our family as a kid. I didn't realize that until I got kind of, you know, later in life, how much of a sacrifice it was. We, all, we both went to a private high school. Right. And that high school wasn't free. Mm -hmm. So looking at, um, you know, the amount of money they were making, how they were frugal in the way that they spent their money and the sacrifices they made, they didn't have the, you know, the luxury cars, they didn't take the extravagant trips across the world. Mm -hmm. Their sacrifice was really given back to us and given up all the essential things that we needed to really grow as individuals and as a family. And I think as a result, we saw that pay off over time. So I had to definitely um, recognize my parents, recognize my older siblings. I was the baby of the family. Uh -huh. um, and you know, I put something on, on Facebook a couple of months ago about I think I was spoiled by my parents, but it really wasn't my parents who spoiled me, it's my older siblings. Older siblings, right. Um, Watching you know, take, out for you. <laughs> taking me to on dates with them when they were teenagers and I was uh -huh. six or seven years old, and I'm sitting in the back seat of a drive in uh -huh. in the back of the car and I'm enjoying popcorn while they're on a date. You know, my uh -huh. brother and I are in the back seat. Like just watching a movie while watching a movie. Hey, you must but, have been a well-behaved little <laughs> little sibling, because I can't picture myself on a, you know, taking my little brother out anyway. Yeah, but it's story. again, it's a, you it's were a, a good a, kid then. You must yeah, have been a good you know, kid. pretty much, pretty much. There I mean, we, do, we we all kind of faced the all the other influences. You know, not wanting to be tainted by what you saw in your community, the uh -huh. negative, you know, things that were happening around you. Staying grounded, 
um, knowing people, but also knowing how to make good decisions. Like when you felt that kind of that, that inner voice speaking to you saying, now you probably shouldn't go in this direction or go right. with those individuals. You probably need to kind of reevaluate uh, what you're doing in this particular moment. But just fortunate to have people around me that were just like instrumental in help shaping us and, and nurturing us and protecting us and helping us grow. Um, I mean, there, there, are, there are so many. I mean, Marcus Garvey read a lot of his books. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he came from Jamaica, you know, coming here as a, you know, trying to liberate the kind of the minds of African people and kind of like challenging the system here in America. You know, I kind of look at the work of Marcus Garvey. I look at all the the other great examples of um, other, you know, African-Americans, you know, who who made those sacrifices so that we can kind of live in a, in a better world. Uh, and there's so many of them that I can talk about. We can talk about the Mecca Evers. We can talk about, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, so many of them. Right. And we all know about Martin Luther King and, you know, exactly. contributions. And, you know, I've heard, I've heard the statement, and it's true, that it's every day is African American History Absolutely. Month because this country, right, has been built on a lot of the sacrifice yes right that African Americans have been through yes. so we can spend a whole we can spend 365 days learning about what the sacrifices that uh, African Americans went through um, but really this this month I think uh, I wanted to do this and also to introduce this book that you that you've been working on the new work that yes. you've been doing with um, you know with your writing as far as uh, what's happening right now in the world. Right, right. So, back in 2020, um, I think it was right after the Jacob Blake uh, situation, um, you know, I started to have some things kind of turn inside of me and my mind started to kind of wander outside of kind of my conventional way of thinking. Like, what can I really do, mm. you know, to bring about a positive change for people? And I had teachers and colleagues come up to me and ask me questions about, well, what can I do in the classroom? So I kind of gave an example of how we can be more culturally aware and culturally responsive in, in, in dealing with um, inequity from a, a classroom, you know, um, space. But when you start looking at how it's in, these uh, interactions are influenced by bigger systems, like, and I, and I break them down in this book that I call The World's Easiest Book on Becoming Anti-Racist, strategies for countering racism in the 21st century. I wrote this book with the idea of making us more aware of what racism is. When we look at it from a historical standpoint, we look at the ideology kind of shapes into our belief system and how those beliefs then begin to influence institutions, the structures, the culture, and the, inner, the way we interact as social beings based on a concept that was created the color-coded brand of racism that was created here in America in our early colonial history. Um, there is there's there's quite a quite a bit of uh, documented history that would support the notion that race as we know it, as a constructed idea, was created here in America. There have been times where other groups have been um, discriminated against because of maybe their nationality, maybe where they came from. But the way it was formed here in America is a very unique form of discrimination. Um, it was blatant. Absolutely, was absolutely blatant. blatant. And I mean, yeah. you keep saying documented. Absolutely. And the documentation, laws, laws that were plainly, absolutely. blatantly written. Uh, and that's something that I picked up from your book. All right, starting with the you know the early beginnings of this country and stuff, and this is this is all historically written, right? It's written, yep. it's documented. So absolutely, um, the different layers that you talk about uh, in the book. Um, now that's that's actually uh, I'm not going to say common knowledge, but can you talk a little bit about those? Because we only hear um, you know about racism, like this general statement about racism, yep. but there's these layers that exist that come from, that we can experience on a daily basis, and then yep. there's some that we don't even know are in, you yep. know, are out there that still affect us. Wow, that's a that's a real deep question. So, uh, one of the things I had to kind of like come to the realization when I even thought about embarking on this project, I had experiences in my life where, I, you know, I had been approached by police officers and thrown to the ground, and, um, not really understanding, like, you know, asking the question, what happened was, was really, really simple. But to really dig into this and say, well, why is this happening? Why is 
this individual deciding to make a decision to cost me in some way. I started seeing that layer as being an interpersonal or individual layer. But I began to ask, well, what is motivating this individual to begin to even think that it's okay for this particular behavior to exist? So when I look at it as a layered system, I'm really looking at establishing a basis for an argument that is not, because it's a complex system of, of inequity, that in order for us to really analyze it and deconstruct it, we have to separate it into these very distinct layers so we'll know how to approach it from within the layer it's operating. So for instance, I gave you the scenario of, um, you know, when I was a teacher back in the late 1990s, I'm teaching literature and social studies, and what I attempted to do by giving or offering different books for kids in the classroom was really addressing it from a cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was being more culturally relevant, more culturally responsive, and I was meeting the needs of kids in the classroom. But what I did not do is see how outside of that culture layer, it was being insulated by an institution mm. that had already determined what the kids were supposed to read in the classroom. So when I left that environment, what probably happened was the old traditional way or the, the, the old books were probably reinstated mm -hmm. because I had made a, a, a very individual change in that specific space. I didn't look to make institutional change, which probably would have required me to go to the you know, county oh, yeah. and build like a, you know, maybe a focus group and talk about what are the needs here, maybe brought parents and community members. But that's the type of collaborative effort and collective vision that we need to overturn systems and create sustainable change. And I think that's what we sometimes lack because the system itself perpetuates these inequities. And if we don't know where they are, where they're operating, there's no way for us to deconstruct it. Right. So that was my reason for putting it into, into five different layers. So when I'm looking at it from a structural layer, that's more big ideas. Those are national ideas. Those are belief systems. But all these things are being fed by an ideology that mm -hmm. a person is different from you. And that difference is how they're able to discriminate against you or create laws or institutions to work for their benefit and to your detriment. And when I say that, I'm talking about people who are socially constructed as, you know, as white in this country, benefit from that system. And those who are constructed as and any of the non-white groups do not receive those same benefits. Right. So you mentioned how, um, you know, we could be insulated yes. from, from the whole, the bigger system. Okay. Now I'm trying to connect it to our situation here. Matter of fact, thinking back to our situation, in a way we were insulated, but in a positive, in a positive way, because man, we didn't experience that right. of growing up, uh, you know, going to a school where we had, um, you know, a good mix of, of, of individuals, right? African Americans, right, right. Uh, Mexicans, Latinos, uh, white teachers, yes. black teachers, right? So again, I think we were we were blessed. I was, I think Absolutely. we were blessed to have that. Right. So then, we grow up, and we got to go out into the real world. <laughs> So I think students yes. in certain situations, especially public school, to some degree, were insulated. But then we grow up and we got to go get, you know, get them out into the real world. Right. And then what happens? The world smacks you the right in the world. face. Oh, man. In the worst yeah, way. I had a student call me a couple of months ago. She was a second year student in one of the local universities here. And she called me. Um, now, she hasn't been my student for about three years now. But mm -hmm. she know because of the relationship we built and I build with students is really, you know, I, I have students really feel that they can call and ask me those tough questions. So she asked me, what am I supposed to do when I'm, I'm in my dorm and every time I walk in with my roommate, um, it seems like the RA challenges more than she does other people. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I asked her, I said, well, can you kind of explain a little bit more? Like, has it, how many times did it? She said, every time we come in. Mm. Other people can just walk right by and she doesn't say anything to them. So one of the things I, one of the first things I told her, I said, well, um, I said, those things happen. I said, I need you to understand that you're not, you're not, it's not so much the individual, it's the system that I would like to address. Mm -hmm. I said, first of all, do you have an ally there on, on, on campus that someone that you trust who's an adult? And she said, yeah, I do. I said, what I want you to do is connect with that individual and share with that individual what you're feeling right now. And she was able to do that. 
And that individual on campus was able to really kind of share with her some really good information on how she could help help navigate her through those spaces. Um, and I think one of those things was really to kind of like have a conversation with that individual. And that individual did not know, or she, you know, she said she didn't really realize that she was asking them questions every time they walked into the dorm. So I think one of the things is making ourselves aware that these 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 attitudes and beliefs might might exist, and understanding that there's a system typically behind that that influences that behavior. Right. So not letting the individuals off, but if we approach it just from that individual layer, typically that might bring anger. It might it might make us feel a little bit more um, like we've been targeted, and it might make us respond in those moments. But understanding that might be other things operate, operating outside that individual's um, way of thinking or the way they're treating you will make us uh, at least think about how we might be able to approach it um, beyond that that simple one-on-one um, -on -one interaction. Right. And I've come to understand it to be uh, microaggressions. And yes. Those microaggressions, they can, they can be very subtle. Yes. Right? So for our uh, seniors and our high school students who are going out into the world, you'll they'll probably experience them whether at a job, in a university, because unfortunately, even though they're higher learning uh, uh, institutions, there's still individuals that come from all different walks of life who, because of the system that you talk about, yes. right, they've been somehow conditioned, all right, to act a certain way, right? And right. unfortunately, uh, at, and in that situation, at a school, maybe you can address it, uh, but they have to take action, right? Yes. You can't just sit back and just be passive, because yes. then now what? It just keeps it just keeps happening over and over and over again. Absolutely. Right? So obviously, staying calm about it, like what you yep. said. Talk to a mentor. Talk to someone. But don't just give it. Don't just chalk it up to like, oh, that's just the way people are. Yep. And then, and then what? You end up carrying that stuff, right? Yep. My fear is students that walk away uh, feeling, you know, dejected, feeling not wanted, yep. and then ultimately maybe dropping out of school because they felt that they weren't a part of, you know, of, of that organization or whatever. So yep. um, I think I think you were a great uh, person to contact in, in terms of this situation, yep. all right, to help students navigate through that, all right, because that's their first experience. Um, hopefully it won't be a, a negative one, right. all right, but, but get through it, all right, and stand up. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where, and I'll give you an example of, of something that happened to me back in 2020. So I'm working um, with kids on campus. I'm dealing with a person who is who is part of our campus, but is not hired from our district. So I okay. can't divulge too much information because right. I'm trying to figure out, you know, kind of who this individual was. But she was elderly, um, probably in her mid 60s. Um, she just so happened to be um, um, a white woman. So we're having a conversation, and um, she, we were, I was in her office, and she looked at me. You know, we were talking about how we're going to support a kid. She said, you know, your name is, um, she said, first of all, she said, you know, well, you're, you're really smart. I said, you know what, thank you. I, you know, I'll, I'll accept that as a compliment. Thanks a lot. So my mom always told me, when people say something to you like that that kind of throws you off, just wait. Just wait uh -huh. a few minutes. Don't say too much because you got to listen to what's coming next. She said, your first name is Du Bois. That's French. Your last name is Irish. That's Macmillan. She said, how did that happen? Right? So, of course, I was blown away. Mm. For you to work, and this individual works with multiple kids from, from various cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, and if you don't know that the African American experience or the Native American experience in this country, mm -hmm. the Latino experience in this country, and the baggage that we carry with naming, then are you even suitable to serve this kid's needs? Because you have to have something that's lacking in your inability to really address the, the personal, the social emotional needs of this particular child. So I had to give her an education for the next 20 minutes that, you know, first of all, my first name, I was named after my father who was named after W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay, that was easy to explain. All right. But then I had to share with her that there's a strong possibility that my family was owned by an Irish family mm. at some point. 
And if I really wanted to get into it, probably would have taken another 40 minutes. I would have to kind of show her how race was constructed in America because the Irish were not considered white initially when they came here to America. Right? Through, through, the, through the codification process, through legal action and how laws were written, eventually Irish were considered white after, um, I believe, the 17th century, maybe into the 18th century. So that could have been a long lesson, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't hostile towards her. I, I didn't show any form of aggression, but I had to humble myself so I can really convey the message in a way that she would receive it in hopes that she didn't use that or say anything like that to another person who walked to that office. So I'm hoping that through those type of moments through the book that we begin to understand that it's important for us if we're serving children that we understand who we're serving mm -hmm. and that we create spaces that make them feel valued and appreciated. And a part of that is knowing who they are. Right. Right? And it's real unfortunate that, uh, all right, judging from her age, her, the, the history curriculum at that time probably <laughs> was, was either limited or, what is it, uh, um, you know, chosen yes, to actually yes. tell only one side of the story. <laughs> and I remember reading those books in elementary or in, in high school. Yes, yes. There were some books that were, weren't telling the whole side. So I think, <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate that she didn't, uh, you know, she wasn't around during these times to actually get the whole, the whole picture. Yeah, All right. Yes. So yes, in yes. a way, we have to be history teachers, too. So we, we have, have to, to know our history. Absolutely. Right? All histories. Like, That's you right. even know you even know more about the Irish than, yes, than yeah. most it's, Irish it's probably do. Yeah, yeah. Right? It, it, so, it, you know, because, I, you know, it, this this whole thing of, 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 of our lived experience and, and our um, having to interact with different people from different walks of life, different, you know, different experiences... It's important that we know who we're who we're who we're dealing with, right? So, so that we don't do those things like have these biases that we can't really reconcile, like in ourselves, and really like get rid of because there there is these belief systems that are operating. A lot of times we have no control over, right? Right. So, you know, for 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 people to to look at another individual and already draw a conclusion of what you're dealing with, that's part of our you know our mental schema as human beings. Like if I were to see a a German Shepherd, because I'm scared of German Shepherds. Yeah. If I saw a German Shepherd run down, <laughs> run from up there to here, I'm going to probably jump over here, even though I shouldn't be jumping anywhere mm -hmm. because of, of what I learned as a kid. Think about all the images that we see throughout our childhood, yeah. you know, our, you know our, our teenage years of, of people and how we begin to, to connect activities, behaviors to those individuals, a lot of times based on who controls the media, who mm -hmm. controls the narrative. So I think it's important for us to appreciate all people, learn as much as we can about those people, um, you know, lived experience, their history, um, so that we can all really uh, begin to appreciate people for who they are. And I think that's where America needs to do a better job. We have to have opportunities for us to see all people in a positive light. You know, the thing, even when, you know, you start talking about, you know, discrimination against women. I mean, we're not, we're talking about something that happened and they, they didn't, you know, stop that until the, the early 1900s, right? Allowing women to even vote. So we start thinking about that in today's world. It doesn't even seem like, it doesn't seem real, right? But there's some other, you know, there's, there's a lot that I think we can do um, within institutions, but I think we really have to begin to address the ideology. Man, and that's the thing about working with, with uh, young people because they're so accepting. I've, I mean, I'm sure you've, you've worked in situations like where, where we, when we grew up, we were also very accepting. Um, and in whatever school settings you were at, yeah. you know, for some, some reason, students tend to be, or young people tend to be very accepting yeah. and understanding of each other, all right? And then something happens when, you know, they start to get out of, um, you know, that comfort zone, mm. all right? And they start to either take sides or they yeah. start to understand yeah. the world a little differently through, through a certain set of lenses. Um, 
but you're right it takes it takes a lot of work and a lot of patience and i think you talk about it in your book all right that that certain system uh you have to be compassionate yes all right understanding which Absolutely. is a challenge i guess yep. Yep. right we have to be the bigger we have to take the, the what is it the higher world be the bigger person right to be able to handle those situations yeah all right so i'm hoping we can probably set up a training you know for teachers uh for administrators uh because i think uh, a lot of times we you know we we forget our role and uh we can teach our students a little bit more in this area Absolutely. especially when it comes to race and accepting others right yeah and like i said a lot of people um it's hard for us to accept the fact that racism still exists so a lot of, uh, you know, you hear a lot of people are in, in complete denial, it doesn't exist, doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, but I ask two basic questions. And this, this is functioning in the ideological um, um, layer. I'm gonna give them two examples. I, I talk about the EGFR number, right, that is given to African or you know, black people that, that increases their, their kidney functioning number, right? That is something that is based on this false ideology that we are different biologically. So that is something that's operating currently right now throughout the United States. So that's something that the University of Maryland has done away with, University of Washington has done away with, and also NYU. Um, the other thing is the NFL recently, about two months ago, they um, basically settled for $1 billion because they were also using race-based factoring in determining CTE functioning for former players who were black. So the black player, players had a different um, factor that they used um, because they believed that they couldn't tell the difference if a person actually had brain damage through their, through their NFL career because they believed that cognitive functioning probably didn't change much from before they started playing football until when they ended. So those are some very specific things that happened recently. So when anyone says racism doesn't exist, yeah, you might not see it on the interpersonal level. That's not what I'm talking about. Of course, we've got to address those issues, but usually that behavior is being informed by something outside of that, that interaction. I've been called the N-word by people in the department store before, and I was, you know, my wife and I first got married. Wow. My response wasn't to slap the woman or cuss the woman out. I maybe, maybe said a few things to her, but, but the reality was that I remember my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Davis, telling me, he says, son, this is a system. Mm -hmm. So don't, you, don't look at the people, look at the system. system. There you go. So when I began to look at it from that aspect, yeah, we have to check the behavior, but we also have to begin to look at, well, where is that coming from? And if we don't, if we can't answer that question, create strategies on how to disrupt it, then we won't be able to bring about the type of change I think we need to have in order for us to really live this, this dream we talk about. And based on the experiences we had, I will be, I will be telling a lie if I went out to the world and said, there's not, there's no goodness out there, no, right? No. I would be telling a lie Same if here. I said that race um, determines how people treat you and, and, and make you feel and how make you feel less valued. Because my experience really disrupted any type of thinking I had based on what I've seen prior to Bourbon Day that made me believe that there's a possibility that we can all coexist in this space and love and cherish each other and support our humanity as opposed to using race as a way to separate us as human beings. So I knew there was something very wrong about that world that we talked about that slaps yeah. you in the face that I didn't quite believe um, I didn't quite believe in. Like, there's ways for us to really build that, but it takes work for us to get yeah. there. And those places still exist. They places do. like Bourbon Day, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, a little school located in South Central LA, yeah. all right? I honestly believe those little neighborhoods, those little communities uh, exist out there. We just need to bring them to light and, and um, you know, learn from them. Absolutely. Right? And talk about them. I think you need to write a book about it. <laughs> hey. I will say, I mean... My last school at Cobra City High School blew uh -huh. my mind. You know, we typically would have like a, um, um, you know, a, a, a multicultural fair, mm -hmm. right? So I think if you create the spaces for oh, kids, okay. kids will figure it out. Go. Yeah. Kids said, we don't want to do multicultural because it, it shows how different we are. They said, we want to do a intercultural intercultural event we want to show how 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 we're connected oh look at that you said that's so a, that was that was looking things look so that. when you facilitate and you create spaces for kids to kind of like feel comfortable with who they are 
and, and, and not be afraid to discuss those tough topics about what separates us, they'll figure out the rest. Carlos, um, Carlos Valverde, big ups to you for, for, for creating that, that space for kids at Corbin City High School. I was fortunately being a part of that for eight years. I was an assistant principal for six years. Right. And I saw some fascinating things happen there. Um, but one of the things that I felt like I didn't do enough of, and I think it wasn't because of my, my lack of understanding, it was that I didn't see how racism was really being influenced by the outside layers. Because I can deal with it when it's on a cultural layer, mm -hmm. but when it got the institution, I got to do a better job at that. When it gets to the structural layer, that's more legal. That's big ideas. Those are laws. Right. You know, when I'm working with like NAACP or organizations like that, they already kind of have a platform for dealing with like that type of like mistreatment and discrimination. But beyond that is that ideology. And I think that's where we really need to kind of look at history and tell people the truth. The African American experience was not, it didn't start in America. Mm -hmm. right? It didn't, you know, we can't continue to just look at that 400 year period and believe that's our, that's our start. We have to look beyond that and begin to figure out well, what was going on before that. Oh, yeah. All the, the empires that were built, the civilization of Egypt and Kemet and um, Nubia. Um, so we have to we have to really explore that. So people began to see what well, they there was major contribution from all groups here mm -hmm. in America, not just one. We we actually have an ethnic studies class here, Fantastic. which I think, man, you know, uh, especially in this in this political climate, uh, I think ethnic studies is going to have to be a mandatory class. Which I think there is some 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 news in the district that they're talking about making ethnic studies a a, a much needed class so that we can understand where there we go where where First of all, where we come from, yes. right? And then hopefully we can get through all of this mess that you know that we're dealing with right now, that's and avoid important. all of this all of this heartache. That's, you know? that's important. That's right. the institutional layer. That's the institutional. I right. Think, I think our I schools I love it. should be able to start doing. It. And I think you're you're going to be instrumental with uh, the workshops that you do. Yeah. Right. To bring that to bring that much needed uh, change and stuff. Absolutely. Because we'll talk about the how. So what's like, that? like the how. Like, like the strategy. Oh, how, how do, how do you, you actually go. implement something like yeah. that? How do you create spaces where kids all feel appreciated? How do you mm -hmm. how do you get teachers really prepped on? Because I think it's 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 more than just the and I had to you know kind of rethink the way I approach it. You know, unless people really understand and accept the fact that all mm -hmm. kids can be great, mm -hmm. and they, you know, and, and it's my job to help them get there that I'm going to live kind of based on what I already know. And a lot of times it's difficult for us to think about, well, what is the possibility? Well, what is it? How can I stretch myself into believing that what I see in front of me is not what I've been seeing on television for the last 30 years? Maybe 5,000 know, images of individuals that may look like this individual who have been shown in a negative light. How do I change? How do I shift? Because part of it is, yeah, you have the compassion for people, but if you don't have the materials to really address the needs of the kid, then what, what, what can the schools do more in helping create that opportunity for, 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 you know, for staff to really get to a point to where they, they know exactly what to do to move forward? Some of the things I talk about there in the book is the Trek model, which is really thinking and analyzing situations, um, agreeing that you're going to respect all human beings involved. Um, next is, is showing empathy by shipping perspective. And lastly, showing the compassion that you talked about. I think if we follow that model, which is a principle-based strategy that my wife and I created, we can at least put ourselves in a situation where we begin to practice those out. So one of the things we do is create scenarios where we put you in a situation, uh, and this book is dealing specifically with race, and you have to kind of like act this thing out and role play. Right. Using this as a model and kind of work your way through it as a way to really get you through tough situations dealing with race. Mm -hmm. So having opportunities to talk about that, say, wow, I, I did feel that. I, I see where you might be coming. I see how not having books that reflect you might not allow you to really, at a deep level, really appreciate who you really are. Right. So we need to make decisions to change that. 
So Got it's it. breaking that ideology. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a great idea. I'd love to see that in, in action. I know I know you have a template for it and stuff yep. like that. So who knows? I think we're going to have to get you back. I appreciate that. Soon, I, I certainly so. like to come back. Hey. I really I like the warm welcome. Your, yeah, your, your so. students are, are fabulous. Yeah, that's the team right They're here. They're doing some amazing things. I've always respected the work that you're doing. You tell me about the CIF championship. Oh, uh, yeah, where to go, ladies. <laughs> I, I always pump them up. It just that's amazes great. me that this that's school, great. like you said, has been around for only five years and they're, you know, they're winning championships. Um, yeah, so the, the the sky's the limit with this Absolutely. school. Absolutely. And we're going to try to make an intercultural uh, event. Hopefully we can make it, you know, make it happen here at our school and start to make our changes from within, right? There you go. All right, Those, Teddy. Little, those little slight changes, those little yeah, tweaks those, right there, when you start thinking about it, it's, it's okay, great. And, and you might want to, like, you know, you, 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 you go one year and then you go to another year. You might do multicultural in a different – because I think it's good for you to appreciate who you are individually, but also that little connection of how people really are connected on a human level, I think that's powerful. Right. Yeah. So I have to ask. So um, – I, I know a little bit about you from back in the days. Okay. And, uh, you know, my man here is not only a doctor, but he's also a rapper. Oh, so man. I know you had, you actually uh, recorded a couple of songs, right? You I'm not actually, rapping today. Though. I know you're not. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> so um, so just to know that creativity, man, oh, it, yeah. Just, yeah. It, it, was, it was all in all your, in, in yeah, all areas man, of your I life, man. It, so, man. I uh, it. you know, I wish we, I wish we went back to those old days where the raps actually oh. told us, taught us stories and stuff, lessons right. about you know what I mean I wish wow. I don't know but see I think like do we even I mean it, that comes from West Africa the, the griot he was the historian yeah, telling in, the story in, in, yeah. in, in, the, in, the, in the community there you go I see? don't like to say tribe because that's that's negative yeah. right you know that's that's you know so he was the person mm -hmm. you know or she was the person like telling stories, stories about like carrying the oral history of the community from one generation to the next. A lot of times they did it like, you know, you know, with playing music. Mm -hmm. um, so those are things I think when you understand that part of it, you begin to kind of at least appreciate rap from a different perspective. You begin to say, wait a minute, maybe there's something here that based on what I've seen, I've seen this, but actually goes a little deeper than that. If we can't really articulate that, how do we really begin to understand the culture of the people that we see rapping, right? That came out of New York and eventually came to other parts of the United States. And that whole culture that has now permeated every part of Absolutely. society. Absolutely. You know? And it's still around. It's not going anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. So we just need to, you know, bring it back. So, um, you know, keep reading, keep writing for all our creative people out there, our students. That's what I'm, in, I'm trying to encourage here at our school, um, you know, so we can have future authors and come back and do the change that, and, and be a part of the change that we're talking about. Absolutely. Right? I'd all right. love to come back. So thanks Definitely. a lot. Definitely. You're going to be back for sure. Watch. All right. Teddy, appreciate all right, man. you again. Love Thank you, man. you, man. Love you, too. My guy right here. Yeah. No. <laughs> this man what's up oh it's, we got okay. a special question yes yes wow that's a, the question is from Sherilyn Nahara she's our she's our senior um uh AV tech rep here so well that's a, that's that's a wonderful question I think when I made a decision I want to write that's something I decided to do a long time ago but sometimes we go through life and, and you have to you have to do the things you need to do to take care of your family. So I had a job. But deep down inside, I wasn't really exploring this. And I knew it was something that I, I knew. And I ask this question all the time to young people when they have questions about like which route they want to take. They might have some different idea or different career um, paths they want, they're thinking about going down. I ask this one very important question I think is, is really telling. I say, when you look back on your life, if you're 80 years old, what is the thing that's going to make you most disappointed about yourself that you didn't make a decision earlier in life? And for me, if I had made that decision at 80 and said, I'm disappointed I didn't, I didn't explore writing, I would be very upset with myself. So, you know, that means that I have to go and do this thing. So there are times that I do get discouraged. Um... But there are some things that I put in place, like my, my workflow for writing is very refined now. 
I spend a lot of time outlining. I spend more time outlining sometimes than I do writing. So when I outline, once I have the outline locked in, the writing part is very easy for me. Um, I do it every single day. I might decide I'm going to write a you know, part of a chapter or if I'm writing fiction, I'm writing a scene that day and I stay committed to that. So I never get into this thing that we call writer's block because I outline very well. But um, sometimes it, it doesn't give you the immediate financial reward that you're looking for. So for me, it's bigger than just writing a book and making money. It's really about being on my personal mission, right? Which is to live in purpose. If I feel like I'm living in, living in purpose, then I'm doing my assignment. And if my assignment is, is completed, when I'm 80 years old and I can look back and say, I completed my assignment, hopefully I'm 100 really when I look back, um, I think I'll be satisfied with the contributions I made to humanity. And that's kind of my motivation. Wonderful question though, I, I love there that. There it is, you got the formula now, yeah. Sherilyn. You... A person that inspired you, like really your life, your yeah, my wife is a just a, a wonderful person. I mean, she is so supportive. And I think if I didn't have her, she's trying to get over here now probably because we were supposed to ride together and she was coming late from a nail appointment. We're, we're leaving out of town in a couple of days. Um, very, very, um, you know, she's inspired me. She's motivated me. Uh, my mother was very motivating also. My mother was a, was a great storyteller. A lot of what I, I think I got from being able to kind of see, like see a scene before it happens and describe like certain characteristics of people, I got that from my mother. I would listen to her as a kid, like she would describe people, like an a, like a uncle of hers who, who maybe wore a certain type of shoe. And she would say, you know, you know, oh, uh, when, when such and such wear them shoes, boy, you can hear that man walking, walking from a mile away. <laughs> And then he come over here and he got them thick heels on and he come through there and he, and he, and he, he got this little cheap cologne on. Uh, so all these things will kind of like be buried in my mind. So when I'm writing characters, it's easy for me to kind of describe characters because my mother was very vivid in how she described things. So when I write a scene, I block out like the five senses. Like what am I seeing? What can I touch? What am I smelling? Is there, am I tasting anything? And once I do that and put myself like in that zone, everything just kind of flows from there. And when you engage your readers by engaging the five senses, you really bring them into your story. You, you, you kind of snatch them in and say, okay, I'm gonna pull you into the story, you're on my shoulder, watch what happened. And I think that is the, you know, that was really a gift I think my mother gave me. So That's um, awesome. Do you want to be a writer? I think so. She keeps asking. And you know, we all have a story to tell, Sherilyn. Do it. Do it. There it's you gonna, go. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a burning desire to do it, there's nothing that can stop you from doing it. No one could, can stop you. So I would say just, um, just write. You know, we'll have you up here. Yeah. Read, all right, we'll yeah. interview you afterwards. How's that? Thank you so much. All right. Again, thank you guys for setting this up. Appreciate you. All right. So again, Teddy, All right, man. Uh, I think we're going to be seeing you back pretty soon. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks a lot. And thanks for your amazing team here. <laughs> Wonderful. It was great being here. I can't here do it without them. Yeah, right. Yep. I need to buy them pizza now. <laughs> Something. <laughs>